most elaborate. Oh, the Princess. Well, good evening to you. Most elaborate, of course, nothing to work. Very good, right? <laughs> it's nice to see you all. Nice turnout like this. My name is Tom Nock, and I'm a member of the Clements Department of History and also the interim director of the Center for Presidential History, while our founding director, Jeff Engel, is on sabbatical this semester. So let me welcome you to this, which is our second event of the 2015-2016 academic year, and I thank all of you for coming. Let me also say thanks to our friends at the George W. Bush Presidential Library, as well as thanks to the Office of the Provost at SMU, which makes this enterprise possible. We're delighted that Alan Lowe, the director of the Bush Library, and Associate Provost Linda Eads are both with us this evening. And I'd like to express my personal appreciation to our Associate Director Brian Franklin and to the Center's coordinator, Rana Spitz, for giving me an awful lot of help this semester. It's been really uh, quite a wonderful experience. Before we get to our main event, I want briefly to draw your attention to two of our upcoming events this fall. On October 27th, and that happens to be on a Tuesday, the Center for Presidential History is co-sponsoring with SMU's Women and Gender Studies program a lecture by Catherine Clinton, who's a historian of American women, the South, and the Civil War at UT San Antonio. And the title of her talk, it's really a great title, I think, Mary Lincoln's Assassination uh, is her talk, and it's part of our continuing series on First Ladies, and you don't want to miss it. And second, on December 9th, we're presenting Kirsten Wood of Florida International University, who will explore music and politics in the early republic. And this will be a rather special event because it will feature musical performances by students from the Meadows School of the Arts. Well, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, for Evan Thomas is not only a best-selling author of major works of history and biography, he is one of this country's most distinguished and influential journalists. Starting in 1977, after college at Harvard and law school at the University of Virginia, he was a writer and editor at Time Magazine for nine years. And then in 1986, he joined Newsweek to become its Washington bureau chief and later assistant managing editor. When he retired from Newsweek in 2010, he was editor at large. And during that period, he wrote over 100 cover stories and won the National Magazine Award twice in 1998 and 2005. Mr. Thomas, on countless occasions, has also appeared on major national television news programs, such as News Hour with Jim Lehrer, Inside Washington, Meet the Press, and The Colbert Report. And he probably holds the record for having been a guest on PBS's Charlie Rose some 40 times. Along the way, between 2003 and 2012, he's taught journalism both at Harvard and at Princeton, and he has managed to write nine books on such diverse topics as the CIA, John Paul Jones, the Spanish-American War, and Dwight Eisenhower. But I'd like to say a word about his very first book, a favorite of mine, published in 1986 and co-authored with Walter Isaacson, and that is a book called The Wise Men, Six Friends and the World They Made. The so-called wise men were lawyers, bankers, and diplomats, and I think you've heard of some of them, Dean Acheson, Charles Bowen, Averill Harriman, George Kennan, Robert Luffett, and John McCoy, and they constitute an extremely important council of advisors to four presidents, uh, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson, and they became the principal architects of America's historic containment policy during the Cold War. No one had ever pulled together the story of these six in quite this, the way this study does. Uh, Robert Caro said that it was a must read if we are to understand the post-war world, uh, a richly textured account of a class and of a historical period, according to the New York Times. And the LA Times stated, in their first major book, Isaacson and Thomas had written an engrossing work of popular history that will live well beyond the 1980s. And the LA Times is quite right because the wise men in retrospect became a significant milestone in a vast, vast historiography on the Cold War. More recently, Evan Thomas has written a book 
about a president who did not consult the wise men, <laughs> although he definitely had his own circle of advisors. And of course, I'm referring to, to being Nixon, a man divided, and the reviews suggest that this may well be his best book so far. Presidential historian Michael Beschloss, for instance, has stated that Evan Thomas, quote, has rendered a Nixon who, in vital and unexpected ways, is very different from the character about whom, for the past 70 years, so much has been said and written. Terrifically engaging, this is Max Boot in the Wall Street, uh, Wall Street Journal, a fair, insightful, and highly entertaining portrait of the 37th president being Nixon should be read by anyone with a more open mind about the oddest man ever to occupy the White House. <laughs> and James Rosen, chief Washington correspondent at Fox News, pronounces it a supremely rewarding portrait, unsparing and generous, rich in history and fresh research and evidence, a new Nixon for the 21st century, innovative and invaluable. So would you please join me in welcoming the author of Being Nixon, Evan Thomas. <laughs> Thank you for that Thank generous, generous, generous introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be at SMU in this beautiful campus. Oh my gosh, in this, in this great building in the city of Dallas, the Big D. It's a, it's a pleasure for my wife, O.C. and I, to be here with you. Richard Nixon. The first time Richard Nixon ever kissed a girl was on a stage. He was uh, performing the role of Aeneas in the Aeneid in the uh, Whittier High School production of the Aeneid, and he was supposed to kiss Queen Dido. Uh, his feet hurt because his boots were too small, and he stumbled over to embrace Queen Dido, and the audience of high school students heretofore bored erupted into hoots and laughter and catcalls. It was so bad they had to stop the show. <laughs> Nixon remembered it was, quote, an unbelievably horrendous experience. The role of Dido was played by a girl named Ola Florence Welch. I just about died, she remembered. In her diary, she wrote, oh, how I hate Richard Nixon. <laughs> now, this kind of experience might have discouraged anyone from ever wanting to be on a stage again. But of course, Nixon appeared on many stages, bigger stages. In college, he was a successful actor. In 1952, when Nixon was giving his famous Checkers speech, to the then largest TV audience ever. Uh, his old drama coach, Al Upton, watching on TV, cried out, that's my boy, that's my actor. What's more, Nixon got the girl. Ola Florence Welch changed her mind about Nixon. In college, she was Nixon's girlfriend for four years. They almost got married. Uh, she later wrote of Nixon, I thought Dick was wonderful, so clever, so strong, so articulate. She did add, there was no hanky-panky but she thought he was, quote, really quite handsome. Now, there was a lot that surprised me as I researched and wrote this book. There was a dark side to Nixon. There was, so I'll get to that. But I wanted to get past the cartoon version, the Hollywood version of the glowering, dark Nixon. We think we know Nixon, Tricky Dick, but what was it like to be Nixon, to actually be Richard Nixon? That's what I set out to, to find out. One question in particular tugged at me. How could someone who is so shy, so painfully shy, be so successful at politics? How could such an introvert succeed at an extrovert's business? And he did succeed. He was one of the most powerful politicians, successful politicians of the 20th century. He was on five national tickets. He won four times. He won in 1972 by one of the largest landslides in history. Only FDR equaled that record. But he was painfully shy. He was terrible at small talk. Uh, he was given to blurting, blurting things out at cocktail parties. We all do this kind of thing, but Nixon really did it. He ran into uh, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis at the funeral of Martin Luther King in 1968, and he said, oh, Mrs. Kennedy, this must bring back many memories. <laughs> he was always trying to impress reporters 1968, before he began his campaign, they got Walter Cronkite, remember him, up and gave him a drink. And so Nixon said, well, I'll have a sherry. And then he thought maybe that's not manly enough, so he said, I'll have a double sherry. <laughs> he didn't really like to talk to people at state dinners when he was president. They, he had an aide stand there with a stopwatch to try to get the dinner under an hour. They got it down to 58 minutes. 
uh, Nixon eliminated the soup course. At his first steak dinner, he spilled soup all over himself, but he announced that real men don't eat soup. <laughs> he was afraid of people, and yet at the same time, and with Nixon, there's always an and yet. There's always a but. At the same time, he was very brave about plunging into crowds, particularly angry, hostile crowds. He was almost killed in 1958 in Caracas and, and Venezuela when an angry mob stormed his limousine. He was vice president and stormed his limousine, smashed the windows. The Secret Service man sitting next to him pulled his gun out and said, well, I'm going to shoot some of these SOBs. And Nixon said, put the gun back. Uh, only shoot if they actually come and pull me out of the car. Nixon was physically brave. He was brave about a lot of things, but he was, he was physically brave. He took courage for Nixon just to, actually for Nixon just to go to a cocktail party took courage, but he was brave about many things. And he, he liked to, he, he took a kind of pleasure in, uh, in, in taunting crowds. You know, he had that famous expression when he did like that. And he got that from, from Dwight Eisenhower, who got it from Churchill, V for victory in World War II. But by 1970, the V was peace, peace sign. So Nixon would go to audiences of anti-war protesters, and he'd go like that, and he says, really drives them crazy. <laughs> and he, he liked to taunt them. And, and in fact, in 1970, October 1970, he caused a small riot doing that. They stoned his bus. Uh, but he kind of liked it. I have to, I'm going to read now from the diary of H.R. Haldeman. This is H.R. Haldeman is Nixon's chief of staff, and his is his diary that, that night. After arrival in San Clemente, the P went home, then kept calling with ideas about how to push the line. Then he called and asked, how are things at your place? I said, fine, and started to talk. He interrupted and said, we're having a fire here, laughed and said the house had caught fire from his den fireplace, told me to come on over, place full of smoke, hoses, firemen, and water, not too much damage. P took me in his bedroom. He was patting around the patio in pajamas, slippers, and a weird bathrobe when I arrived, and said there was no problem. The place was full of smoke. I could hardly breathe. He said he loved smoke and would sleep there. I talked him into the guest house. We went over there, had a beer, and talked about the day, finally to bed about 1 a.m., a really weird day, especially the last parts of it. He was very tired, but in great humor. He pulled down his pajamas and showed me horrible bruise on his thigh from motorcade in Rochester. All through the day, he delighted in giving the V sign to the peaceniks. Imagine being H.R. Haldeman, being Nixon's chief of staff. What a strange thing. Nixon, Haldeman called Nixon the strangest man I ever met. So how did Nixon do it? How did this poor boy, and he was a poor boy, he was born dirt poor in Yorba Linda, California. How did this outsider get there? Uh, he was a very uncomfortable child. His father was a bully. His mother, he called his mother saintly, but she was passive aggressive as far as I can tell. He hated watching them fight with each other. <clears throat> he was very fastidious. He went barefoot, as many boys did, but he would carry his shoes in a brown paper bag. He really had no friends, but he was very smart. He got offered a scholarship to Harvard. He couldn't go there because there was no money to get him across the country. He went to Whittier College instead. And there, an important insight. At Whittier, as at a lot of colleges, there was a fraternity for the cool guys called the Franklins. Nixon started a fraternity for the uncool guys called the Orthogonians because he knew there are more uncool guys than cool guys. Basic insight, Nixon understood that outsiders want to be represented against the establishment, that they want a voice against the insiders. And uh, as he ran for student body president at Whittier, on his, his platform was bringing dances to Whittier. Now, Whittier is a good Quaker school and uh, very uh, upright at that time. What was Nixon doing? Nixon understood that the rich kids could go to dances anytime they wanted. They could go to the country club. They could go to restaurants. It was the poor kids who couldn't go to dances. Nixon represented them, and he won easily. This went on and on. Uh, Nixon coined the phrase, the silent majority in 1969. You remember that? Campuses are blowing up. And there are a lot of people out there who are just silently enduring all this and don't like the New York Times and don't like the Washington Post and don't like Wall Street and don't like Harvard and feel that their voice is not being heard. He spoke for them. Pretty effectively, in 1972, when he won that landslide, he won 35% of registered Democrats. You know, Reagan gets the credit for creating the modern Republican Party. 
it was Nixon who really knew how and learned how to peel away disaffected Democrats who were fed up with the liberal establishment. Still, still, Bush was haunted by the cool guys, one in particular, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Now, Kennedy and Nixon arrived in Washington at the same time, 1946, as young congressmen. Their offices were across the hall from each other. They were friends. Nixon recognized in Kennedy a kind of kindred shyness. Kennedy, for all his glamour, was a shy man. And he and Nixon bonded. But, and they bonded in sort of interesting ways. Uh, when Nixon was going to Europe in 1948, on a fact-finding mission, uh, Kennedy gave him the list of three girls to look up in Paris. Uh, Nixon was so uncomfortable that he left the list behind. Uh, now, by 1960, they're running against each other for president. That does not make for friendship, particularly when Nixon heard it, uh, that John Kennedy said of Nixon, he has no class. You can imagine how that felt. There's that famous debate. You remember Nixon sweating through his makeup. Kennedy, cool and tanned. Uh, there's a story behind the makeup, early days of TV, and the producer before the debates came to Kennedy and he said, would you like any makeup? Kennedy said no, then went to his dressing room and had some Max Factor applied to him. It, Nixon said, no, no makeup. Then he had one of his aides go down to Michigan, Michigan Avenue and buy something called Shave Stick, this kind of hideous stick that you put on to cover up five o'clock shadow. And you can see it. If you look at the video, Nixon is sweating through this gray grease uh, that he's put on his face. It was just an unfair fight. Uh, Nixon prepared for the debate by grinding and studying. Kennedy prepared for the debate by taking a nap and listening to Peggy Lee records. It was just not, not, not fair, especially not just on style points, but because a lot of scholars believe Kennedy stole that election. In Illinois and in Texas, there was a lot of vote stealing going on. Uh, in Chicago, in one precinct, more people voted for Kennedy than lived there. Uh, but Nixon chose not to challenge the election results. He could have, but he chose not to because he understood that the country was in the middle of a Cold War. It was a dangerous time. This was not the time to drag the country through a messy uh, court fight, political fight. And so he graciously conceded. But it ate at him. The Kennedys, it got under his skin. It ate at him. Because he believed, he thought, and not incorrectly, that the Kennedys were better at dirty tricks than he was. You know, Nixon in later years was uh, rightly accused of trying to use the IRS to harass his political opponents. Well, Nixon's tax returns were audited in 1961, 1962, and 1963 at the order of Attorney General Robert Kennedy. That's where Nixon learned about the IRS, about how to use the IRS. Bobby Kennedy, as Attorney General, wiretapped many more people than Richard Nixon ever did. So Nixon brooded, had this kind of brooding resentment against, against the Kennedys. The other cool kids, so to speak, who, who drove him nuts were the Georgetown set. Uh, in Washington and Georgetown, after World War II, there was a kind of a clique, if you will, a kind of a smart set that the wise men were, were part of it. Uh, Harvard and Yale graduates who had top jobs at CIA and state and defense, and they formed a kind of ruling class. And Nixon was very uncomfortable around them. In 1950, Joe Alsop, the columnist, famous Washington columnist, who was at the center of this circle, along with my old boss at the Washington Post Company, Catherine Graham, uh, invited Nixon and Mrs. Nixon over for dinner after Nixon had been elected senator from California. And of course, Alsop, uh, got Nixon's name wrong. He called him Russell Nixon. Uh, and uh, Ambassador Harriman, uh, when Nixon came in, turned his plate over and turned off his hearing aid and said, I will not break bread with that man, and walked out. You can imagine how Richard Nixon felt about that and how Mrs. Nixon felt about it. This went on and on. Nixon just could never get it right with the so-called smart set. Uh, after he was elected president, he deputized Henry Kissinger as national security advisor to be kind of an ambassador to Georgetown, an ambassador to the court of Catherine Graham, if you will. And Kissinger was very successful at it. Kissinger is charming and uh, funny and self-deprecating, something that Nixon could never be. And the Georgetown crowd loved Kissinger. But 
Kissinger started making jokes about Nixon, about the president. And of course, these jokes got back to Nixon. He heard about it. He tried to be philosophical about it. He said, well, Henry's got a big ego. He needs this. He would sort of lamely joke when, when Kissinger was leaving in the evening, there goes Henry to leak to the Washington Post, or there goes Henry to see his friends in Georgetown. But it was painful. It was painful, especially when Kissinger started going around bragging about his own achievements and exaggerating them, saying that going to China, that was Kissinger. Kissinger was a brilliant national security advisor, and he brilliantly executed Nixon's strategy. But it was Nixon's strategy. It wasn't Kissinger's idea to go to China. It was Nixon's. In fact, when H.R. Haldeman told Kissinger that Nixon planned to go to China, uh, Kissinger's response was, bad chance. Uh, now again, Kissinger was a great national security advisor, but Nixon just got under his skin. And so those famous tapes, they're not installed. The White House tapes are not installed till February 1971, two years in. Why? Because Nixon wanted to keep a record to be able to rebut Henry Kissinger. It's in Haldeman's diary. Nixon wanted, would, wanted to be able to say, you know, here's how it actually went down in my office. Here's what we actually said, not what Kissinger says we said, but here's what we actually said. That's why he began taping those conversations, to have a record. Now, it's true those tapes are terrible. Many of you, probably all of you, have heard at least snippets of them. They're awful. Nixon is anti-Semitic. He's occasionally a little bit racist. Uh, he, he goes on in this kind of profane way. But you know, as I listen to them, and my wife was here, also, you know, I listened to hundreds of the hours of them, it, I realize that Nixon is posturing. He's showing off. It's a kind of a braggadocio. It's not really him. He's trying to pretend. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, Mad Men, the TV show Mad Men, that kind of 50s kind of posturing swagger that, that, uh, that men would do. If you want, if Nixon was bad at swearing. If you want to hear good swearing, listen to LBJ's tapes. Uh, the other thing about Nixon's aides was they knew, Nixon's own aides knew this was bluster. And when, when Nixon would say outrageous things, they, you know, they didn't know his, they didn't know his carry out his orders. They, 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 they understood that he didn't really mean it. And they also understood what a, what a, what a, what a private man he was. Uh, Nixon would go off, um, late at night with his, with his yellow pad. And he would write uh, notes to himself. His yellow pad, his aide said his yellow pad was his best friend. And he would write notes to himself where he would uh, uh, use words like joyful, serene, inspiring, confident. That's not who Richard Nixon was, or it was at least not who he was in the morning, but it's who he wanted to be, who he was trying to be. Nixon wanted to be upbeat and confident. I was really struck by this. Uh, his daughter, Julie, did an oral history. And she described dad coming home at night. And when he came through the door, he'd be whistling. And he would turn on all the lights. And he'd put a show tune on the record player. And he wanted to have happy conversation. He wanted to be an upbeat, optimistic person. He couldn't always be that person, but he wanted to be him. Now. You know, it's true he did some pretty ugly stuff. There's, there's, just, there's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but again, you, you need to have some historical context here to, to, to be able to understand Nixon. As I said, Nixon's aides knew not to carry out his orders often, his crazier orders. But not always. Remember the Pentagon Papers. Pentagon Papers were the secret history of how we got into the Vietnam War. Um, they were uh, tough, but they never mentioned the words Richard Nixon. They were about Democrats. But Nixon hated them because Nixon did like leaks. He was conducting secret diplomacy at the time, and he didn't want there to be leaks. So Nixon, in his obsessive way, got excited about, uh, about leakings and, and about he wanted the FBI to investigate. Uh, he wanted them to catch Ellsberg was the leaker, and he wanted them to dig up some dirt on Ellsberg. Well, here's where some historical context is useful. For years, the FBI was willing to do the dirty work of presidents. Uh, 
including LBJ. When LBJ wanted somebody to spy on political dissidents at the 1964 Democratic Convention, the FBI did it for him. Because Hoover, the head of the FBI for 40 years, the way he stayed in office was by pleasing presidents, also blackmailing presidents, but by pleasing them by doing their dirty work. But by 1970, Hoover was a very smart politician, can see that the wind is changing. And the FBI is being sued for illegal wiretapping. And the Warren Court, the liberal Warren Court, has discovered the Bill of Rights, including the Fourth Amendment. And the law is starting to change here. So Hoover says the FBI is not doing this anymore. The FBI is out of the political spying business. So what does Nixon do? He goes in-house. He creates the plumbers. Remember them? Now, the plumbers sound like a tough bunch. There's a, a G. Gordon Liddy and Howard, E. Howard Hunt. E. Howard Hunt was a former CIA case officer, and Liddy was an FBI agent. But in Washington, you have to look a little closer. Hunt and Liddy were actually screw-ups. They had been dumped on the White House. The CIA dumped Hunt on the White House to get rid of him. The FBI dumped Liddy on Treasury, which dumped him on the White House, to get rid of him. Those guys were stumble bumps. And they were run, their boss in the White House was a guy named Eagle Krogh. Eagle Krogh's nickname was Evil Krogh. It was a joke. He wasn't evil. He was an Eagle Scout. He was a nice, well-intentioned lawyer who had no business trying to run a bunch of spies. They were terrible at it. They broke into Ellsberg's office. They made a mess of that. Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office made a mess of that. They broke into the Watergate. They got caught. N Nixon didn't know about any of this. Nixon was not aware about the break-in before the fact. Now, it is true that Nixon participated in the cover-up. Yes, that's true. He did. But even that is not, as I listen to those tapes, it's not Nixon as evil mastermind plotting to break the law. It's Nixon who's uncertain, who's going off in different directions, and who's afraid of confrontation. Nixon said that he was afraid of personal confrontation. He says this in his own memoirs. After watching his mother and father fight, he hated it. And so he was unable to confront his own aides. He doesn't get Haldeman and Ehrlichman and John Mitchell, the attorney general, and and John Dean into one room to ask them what the hell happened here until March 1973. The Watergate break-in was June 1972. Nine months have passed. It's too late to fix things. They're, they're, they're obstructing justice by now. The cover-up is going on. Nixon is basically finished. Uh, the end game is, is, is ugly. It, it is. Uh, I was particularly affected by what happened to Nixon's marriage. You know, we have this image of Pat Nixon as uh, the photographs of her. She looks tired and worn and kind of too thin and drawn. But that's not the way she was much of the time. Uh, in fact, early in their marriage, they had a, they had a, they had a great marriage. The marriage was not so great in the last year of Watergate. Uh, even Julie says both mom and dad were drinking a little bit too much, uh, and, and I, which translation means they were drinking a lot too much. Uh, and I noticed that when Nixon decided to resign, he didn't tell Pat. He told his secretary, Rosemary Woods, to tell Pat. So that's what the marriage was like in 1974. But if you look at their love letters, uh, which are available in the Nixon Library, they loved each other. It was clear. They were, they were sincere, rich, loving letters. And I ran a picture of the two of them together in my book, taken in 1953, because Pat is a knockout. She's a great beauty. And you can see this his expression on Nixon's face. He looks like that guy in high school who can't believe his good luck that he married <laughs> the prettiest girl there was. Uh, he courted her, typical Nixon. He courted her. He would drive her on dates to be on dates with other men. He would read a book in a hotel lobby when she went on dates with other men. Then he'd pick her up and drive her home. And he finally wore her down, and she said yes. And she stood by him. She didn't like politics. But she understood that if, and I found five times when he said, I'm quitting, I'm getting out. And she said, no, you can't. Not because she liked politics, but because she wanted to stand by him. She understood that if he got out of politics, it would crush him. So she stood by to the bitter end. And the end was bitter. You know, that famous scene of Kissinger and Nixon kneeling together. This is in the mythology. It's true that two nights before 
Nixon resigns. He asked his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, to get on his knees and pray. Nixon was actually quietly religious. He was a Quaker who prayed every night. And Kissinger went back to his office afterwards. He had sweated through his shirt, and he said to his aides, you can't believe what just happened here. And he starts to tell his aides about it, and the phone rings. And it's Richard Nixon calling, asking him, asking him not to tell anybody. <laughs> Kissinger put an aide on the phone, on the extension. It was in the Washington Post in two days. And that's, that's what it was like for, for, for Nixon. Uh, the, Nixon damn near died. He had phlebitis. Uh, he was, he was on, literally on a hospital bed in a coma, a nurse slapping him, saying, wake up, Richard, wake up. But the thing about Nixon is that he had a way of coming back, always had a way of coming back. And he did. He, he, he came back. He was completely broke. He was so broke that Ed and Tricia, his daughter and his son-in-law, had to loan their life savings to Nixon so he could pay for his grocery bills. He was that broke when he got out. But he, he rebuilt his life, he played some golf, he wrote some books, and he started, I love this, he started, all those journalists who'd hounded him out, he started having them over for dinner and giving them big Chinese meals and, and talking about world events, and just he just, he was fearless that way. He was always Nixon, one, one of them who went to one of those dinners, uh, Michael Kramer of Time, told me that he asked if he could use a phone, and Nixon said, use my study, and, and uh, of course on Nixon's desk, Nis Nixon had not only written out his talking points for the evening, he'd written out his lame jokes. So Nixon was always Nixon, but he was brave about seeing reporters. He, he started counseling presidents. Again, at first the presidents were kind of standoffish. Jimmy Carter really didn't want to have anything to do with uh, Nixon. But by Reagan, they're at least quietly talking to him. And by Jimmy, by, by, by Clinton, uh, Clinton loved Nixon. And weirdly, they were an odd couple. They got along uh, just, just fine. Uh, uh, you know, and at the end, at the very end, this is interesting to me. After this is the, 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 says something about the marriage. You can Google uh, Pat Nixon funeral, and you will see that Pat Nixon is. Excuse me, that Richard Nixon is not just crying about Pat Nixon. He's bawling. He's undone about the death of his wife. He was dead within a year himself. Uh, so, uh, you know. I was fascinated. One thing that fascinated me about Nixon, and I just worked on and worked on, was how, you know, did did he ever have any moral guilt about this? Was he was he self? You can, and you cannot find any example of him expressing moral guilt. He does say to uh, Robert, to uh, to uh, uh, in the Frost Nixon uh, interviews, he says to David Frost, "Well, they gave me this. I gave them the sword, and they stuck it in, and I would have done the same." So it's kind of an admission, but not really. Uh, it's it's and it's never a moral admission. Uh, you, you just it just that wasn't in Nixon to to be that way. Instead, what you hear from Nixon much more is this sense of of destiny. He had a sense of personal from the very beginning a sense of personal destiny. I was really struck that uh, in 1962 he's, he's he's finished in politics. You may remember that famous press conference when Nixon says he won't have Dick Nixon to kick her out anymore. That's 1962. He's lost his. Presidency in 60, he's lost the California governor's race in 62, he's finished. And they were writing his political obituary. So he goes to make some money as a lawyer, but he can never get over his desire to be in public life. And so he, he was close friends with a guy named Leonard Garment, typical Nixon friend, totally different from Nixon. He was a Jewish guy from Brooklyn who voted for Democrats, but was Nixon's best friend. And they go down to Florida together, Nixon's gonna make a speech, and uh, Nixon at the last moment decides not to stay where they're supposed to stay because he thinks he's going to be used by a developer to try to sell some houses. So they get in a car, they drive 40 miles to the house of, of another friend. They get there, of course, it's dark. It's a walled, gated community. Nixon throws his briefcase over the wall and says, over the wall we go, Leonard. And <laughs> they climb over, they find an empty pool house. They lie down on a couple of cot, cots. Garment said it was like summer camp. And Nixon, who never slept, stayed up all night talking about his desire to get back into public life, how much he needed to serve, to be in public life again. He said, if I don't, I'll be uh, mentally dead in two years and physically dead in four. Uh, he said, the only thing I don't want to do is see a shrink. Uh, he is actually sort of seeing a kind of shrink at the time, typical Nixon. 
Uh, but the thing about Nixon, he just resisted any kind of self-analysis. That's just not what he did. Uh, I would ask people, I would ask people who work with him, I said, do you think Nixon was self-aware? Do you think Nixon was self-aware? And they would say no. Uh, Brent Scowcroft said, well, I think maybe he took a peek every once in a while. Uh, but then Jim Schlesinger, who was uh, Nixon's uh, CIA director and uh, Secretary of Defense, I asked that question of Schlesinger, and he said no. And then he looked out the window and he said, but who is? Good question. Who is self-aware? Who really is self-aware? Particularly powerful men and women who have to get things done. Because if you think about it, it's hard to get up in the morning and say you're going to save the world if you're worrying about where your car keys are or whether you're really good enough or how you're getting along with your kids. You know, you have to be focused. You have to have that tunnel vision. And Nixon had that. He had that tremendous drive to do things. Uh, and yet I always suspected, I always wondered, I always wondered what he was really thinking. One thing that really struck me, Nixon loved to going, going to the movies. He watched 500 movies uh, as a president of the United States. His favorite was not Patton. It was Around the World in 80 Days. <laughs> and he'd say, when the scene with the elephants, he would say, wait, here comes a good part. And uh, uh, Julie wrote, in, uh, wrote, wrote that, well, you know, we sat through a lot of clunkers with Dad, uh, and, and, and Julie and David would try to sneak out, and, and uh, B.B. Rebozo would fall asleep. And Nixon would always say, wait, wait, it's going to get better. Now, it didn't get better for Richard Nixon. It got worse. But I, he never stopped trying. I, and I think he was all his life in this kind of struggle uh, to, be a, to be a better person, of the forces of darkness and light, if you will. I think he really, really, really felt that. Uh, and, and he was ultimately done in by his own desire for revenge. As he was leaving the White House uh, at the very end, uh, his last words are, uh, if you hate your enemy, your enemy wins, and that will destroy you. Well, hello, did that suddenly occur to Nixon? You know, he had, he had destroyed himself exactly for that reason. But you can't find in the record much of any awareness of, uh, about this. I, was, I actually was curious if he had ever uh, uh, read Shakespeare or the, the ancient Greeks. Because he made a little reference, he said to his son-in-law, Ed, he said, well, this is like a Greek tragedy or a Shakespeare tragedy, it just has to play out. I, I, I went in his school papers at Whittier or in the Nixon Library and read them. He had actually read Shakespeare's Julius Caesar and written a paper about it. It's a terrible paper. He totally missed the point. He didn't get, he didn't get hubris at all. But his own life was a Shakespearean drama. It was, it was a great tragedy. It's a great story, and I hope you read the book. Thank you. We have microphones um, on each side of the audience. Our postdocs, Evan McCormick and Tim Sale, will be available for you. And you want to feel your Yes, questions? absolutely, yeah. yeah. Fire away. Uh, I didn't like him. Uh, if, you lift, if you sat with me and my wife Elsie listening to those tapes, you wouldn't like him either. Uh, yeah, he's pretty unlikable. Although even the tapes, I got to say, you have to listen to more than the Watergate tapes because he's at his worst and what he's showing off and blustering. He's very substantive. He, you know, he's actually, think about, about Nixon. Nixon pretended to be anti-intellectual. He said, quote, he said, I hate intellectuals. He said, uh, they're sort of feminine. I'd rather talk to an athlete. Well, wait a second. He was a terrible athlete, but he was an intellectual himself. <laughs> he was much better read than uh, most presidents. I, I looked at his private libraries out at Yorba Linda, and I went through a political philosophy. And he's like a graduate student, underlining, making stars. I mean, he always said he, he was always denouncing, you know, he was always denouncing Harvard. He said, uh, none of those Harvard bastards in my cabinet, do you understand? Well. His chief, his national security advisor was a Harvard professor, Henry Kissinger. His chief domestic advisor, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, was a Harvard professor. So with Nixon, it was important to watch what, as John Mitchell said, watch what he did, not what he said. So, so this is a complicated answer to your question, but 
you, there are different parts of, you would have liked some parts of Nixon and not other parts. What it was moving to me, the poignancy is that he wanted to be the good Nixon, he just couldn't be that person. So I felt for him. I didn't like him, but I felt for him. Yeah. Now, if you will, uh, wait for a microphone to come to you so everyone can get a question. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, one of the most famous incidents in Nixon's career is when he was vice president and had his impromptu debate with Nikita Khrushchev. I was wondering if you uh, had any thoughts about that incident. Um, it seems like one that could be filled with amusing anecdotes because it's such a bizarre story. You would never expect the general secretary of the Soviet Union to get into a debate with the vice president of the United States. It was, it was a Fluke, he was over there uh, going to a trade show. There wasn't a whole lot of travel between the United States and the Soviet Union in the late 50s, but Nixon was invited over to go to a, a trade show uh, where we were showing off the modern American kitchen. The Soviets let us do that. And somehow, <clears throat> Khrushchev was there, and they got into an impromptu debate. It was great for Nixon, because he was able to show that he could stand up to Khrushchev some of you may recall, was a scary figure in the late 50s, bombastic, talking about how the rockets were going to fly, took his shoe off and pounded the podium at the UN and said, we will bury you. Scary guy. And Nixon, Vice President Nixon, is seen standing up to him. They had a kind of a little profane debate at first. And, and then Nixon was actually quite articulate. And he got himself on the cover of Time with the Kremlin Towers in the background. And it gave him the kind of credibility he needed to see not just a political hack, but as a statesman. So it was a, it was a vital moment in his political career. Yes. You know, I've often wondered, you know, we all love our parents usually. What was his relationship with, like, with his daughters, and then how do they view him? And do, they ever, do they ever see the side of him that we all sometimes see, the dark side? Yeah. I mean, he's a pretty good father. One reason why, he can't be that bad. If, if his daughters love him that much, how bad can he be? Uh, and Julie's a very effervescent uh, person. Uh, Tr Trisha, the oldest one, is a little quieter. Uh, but they he was devoted to them, and they were devoted to him. And they spoke on his behalf. Uh, they, I, they, did, they refused to speak to me. I got, I got as close to Julie. I got directions to her house. Uh, and within, she canceled with a week to go. Uh, I later heard her quoted as telling somebody else about me, what's the use? I mean, you know, it's just. They're not going to turn around. They, don't, they, they think it's too late to turn around the image of Richard Nixon. Uh, I don't know what they think of my book. Uh, the inner Nixon inner circle of old staff likes it relative to other books uh, <laughs> a lot. Uh, and, and I was told that, they, that I, they, they think that I got the actual Nixon. Now, they're partisans. Uh, but uh, I... I you know, Nixon was a funny guy. He was a good family man in a lot of ways. He was a faithful husband. Uh, he had a very formal, correct relationship. I was told uh, by Frank Gannon, who uh, ghost wrote Nixon's memoirs, that in the last couple of weeks before Watergate, they're, in, they're having dinner together every night in the White House, and they're not talking about Watergate. They're not talking about the elephant in the room. They're talking about the weather. And then at night, they would pass little notes to each other and put little, leave little notes on their pillows. It, and it was, he said it was like out of a, a novel by Tolstoy, this kind of very formal, 19th century, polite uh, courting. I, I, I talked to Nixon's housekeeper, and I asked him about their late marriage. And he said they were very formal and correct together. They didn't talk about their bodily ailments at all. But Nixon would always hold the chair for Mrs. Nixon when she came down for dinner, very kind of 19th century sort of Victorian, but I think close relationship. Yeah. What role did his faith play in his, his life? I think he's the only Quaker president yeah. that we've had. Did he continue to practice his faith and what sort of yeah. um, yeah. influence did that have on him? Well, right, good question, because he doesn't seem like, I mean, he's a Quaker. He's brought up as a Quaker, but he's bombs away as the president. Uh, and uh, 
and he, you know, he had to make a decision, as a lot of young Quakers did in World War II. You know, he was, he was an anti-interventionist in 1940 and 41. Once Pearl Harbor happened, he went into the Navy right away and wanted to go into combat. He was, beside, he was behind the lines as a supply officer, but not because he didn't want to be on the front lines, but because that's where they, they put him. So he had to cross that bridge early in life. Uh, he's cynical and sarcastic and very profane and seemingly irreligious in his conversations. However, however, and there's always a however with Nixon, he got on his knees every night and prayed. I th I'm sure sincerely. Uh, his mother was a very private Quaker. She got, actually got into a closet to pray because her faith was so, so unto itself and so internalized and didn't, didn't want to do anything showy. Nixon's father, on the other hand, was an, ev this is kind of a contradictory thing, an evangelical Quaker who would take the kids to see Amy Mc Simple McPherson and to revival meetings in uh, uh, Billy Sunday. Uh, and Nixon was later close to Billy Graham, as a lot of presidents were, but Nixon was pretty close to him. In fact, claims that he decided to run in 1968 after Billy Graham read to him from Romans about his destiny and and need to, to, to need to save the world. This scene in the, in the memoirs feels slightly contrived to me, but, but I don't doubt that, that Billy Graham was there and that they had a real relationship. I'm giving you a contradictory answer. There was the profane, day-to-day, -day, even warmongering Nixon, but I think there was the private, quietly faithful Nixon in the early morning hours. Maybe like a lot of us. Yeah. Um, I'm reading the uh, President's Book, um, yeah, uh, President's Club, I'm sorry, the President's yeah. Club, the book, um, and they talk in there about uh, Nixon hijacking the uh, Vietnam peace stocks early on while yeah. LBJ was still president, which seems like a really, bad really story. bad, let me, let yeah, me, so I was going to say, yeah, yeah this thoughts. is a bad story, but like everything about Nixon takes some explaining, so let me sort of set the table here. Fall of 1968, Nixon is running against Humphrey. And uh, President Johnson, with about three weeks before the election in October, President Johnson says, we're going to cease bombing and let's have peace talks in Paris. And Nixon goes, oh my gosh, Nixon, who'd been ahead of Humphrey, if peace suddenly breaks out here, I could lose. You know, Humphrey could make a late surge here and beat me. Well, Nixon already has a back channel running to President Chu, a secret back channel to President Chu through somebody, uh, Mrs. Anna Chenault, known as the Dragon Lady, uh, was, was the back channel. And, and Johnson's listening in on it because the CIA, of course, has wiretapped the uh, South Vietnamese ambassador's office and President Chu's office. So Johnson knows what Nixon is doing. Uh, whoa. And, and Johnson says to his aides, it's treason. So they, they can hear on these wiretaps the messages conveyed uh, you know, to two, don't do anything rash here. The, the imp implication is you'll get a better deal from me, Nixon, later. Don't, don't go to Paris and make a deal. This is why Johnson's just going nuts. So it sounds pretty awful. But scholars who've gotten into this, who've gotten into two's papers, President Two's papers, realized that Tu was never going to make a deal, no matter what Nixon said to him. Tu, in 1968, was not going to go to Paris and basically sign his death sentence because the North Vietnamese were insistent that Tu had to go, and Tu was never going to make that deal. Four years later, the, the North Vietnamese, after a lot of bombing and misery, the North Vietnamese agreed to keep President Tu for a time, <laughs> for, you know, for 22 months. But they did agree to keep him. That was not going to happen in 1968. The point is that all of Nixon's finagling, which was pretty bad, didn't make a difference because Chu wasn't. So it didn't really change the course of history. So history is always more complicated uh, than, than, than it seems. I'm not excusing Nixon. What he was doing was pretty close to the edge. Interestingly, Johnson knew this about Nixon, but never went public with it. Interesting that Johnson had this thing on Nixon, but Nixon never went public because in those days, campaigns would collect dirt on each other and not use it. It was a, it was a, the political version of mutual assured destruction. <laughs> they would sort of have their own missiles, but not fire them. Uh, I always this detail I always loved. 
Remember Bill Moyers, the sainted Bill Moyers? He was chief dirt collector for LBJ. He, would, he kept the file on Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater was drinking and fooling around. Uh, so uh, we were talking about s people who could be saintly and do dirty <laughs> things. Uh, uh, so that was sort of the rules of the game, was that you didn't launch on each other. So Johnson never made any of this with Nixon. Nixon was, of course, suspicious that Johnson calling for the peace talks was all political ploy. It was just to get Humphrey elected. That wasn't true either. Uh, the evidence now suggests that Humphrey wasn't that eager to, excuse me, Johnson wasn't that eager to do it. His own generals had to talk him into doing it. This is the classic case of the journalism gets a little bit, and then the first group of historians get a little bit, but there's always more to get. I mean, one of my favorite phrases, I was a journalist for 34 years, and the, uh, the guy who created the Washington Post owner who owned my magazine, Newsweek, Phil Graham said, Journalism is the rough first draft of history. <laughs> and this, is, this, is, this story that I'm telling is one of those that's had m multiple drafts. Maybe there'll be w one more. But it's a, and a, of course, as you get into these stories, they get more complicated. They don't, they don't get simpler. They get harder. Yeah. Do you see any similarities, both professionally and personally, between President Nixon and Robert Kennedy? Wow. Uh, yes, actually. I wrote a biography of Bobby Kennedy. And uh, they did it. They were both insecure in, in some real ways. They both were kind of, uh, they both had sorry childhoods. Uh, Bobby Kennedy's nickname in his own family was Black Robert because he was depressed all the time. Bobby Kennedy's own description of himself was somebody who fell down a lot, who wasn't that smart, couldn't keep up with glamorous Jack and, and the, older, the older siblings, and felt this kind of insecurity. But from that insecurity came drive, tremendous focused drive. Same thing for Nixon. From Nixon's insecurities, from his vulnerabilities, came this tremendous drive, much of it positive and powerful, some of it self-destructive and vengeful, but drive nonetheless. So I think the two of them did have some similarities. Of course, they were politically dissimilar. They were both connivers. They were both dirty tricksters. Uh, they both used deceit. Uh, they could both be moralizers. Particularly, Bobby was a was a real moralizer. Um, but yeah, I, I, you've, you've, I haven't thought about this enough. But the question has me thinking. They had a surpri actually surprisingly had. They, of course, they hated each other, completely hated each other. But that's maybe because they were alike. Could you uh, explain the relationship between Gerald Ford and Nixon? And, and specifically, did Nixon have any idea before he resigned that he would be pardoned? Well, there's, there's a conspiracy theory on this. And the, 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 the facts are gauzy at best. But Al Haig, who is Nixon's chief of staff, comes to Vice President Ford uh, a few to maybe a week before Nixon resigned. And he said, well, you can do several things here. And one of the options is you can pardon him. Now, if you listen to that, was Haig sending a signal to Ford? You know, you can pardon him. You can, you can be president. All you have to do is, you know, little wink here. You, you agree to pardon him, and my guy will leave, and, and you'll be president. And depending on whose story you believe, uh, when this conversation happened again in the middle of the night, Ford sent a signal that, yeah, uh, I hear you on the pardon. Now, this was sharply denied in the morning uh, by Ford. In fact, Ford got on the phone and called Haig and said, I'm not making any deals. For the record, I'm not making any deals. But there's still some historians who believe that maybe a little signal was transmitted there that, that Ford understood that if he winked and said, you can have a pardon, through a wink, uh, he, he could become president. I don't, I don't know the truth, and we're never going to know the truth. What did Nixon think of Ford? Nixon uh, had a long history with Ford. They had been in the Chowder and Marching Society, kind of a frat of congressmen in the, early, in the late 40s. Uh, but uh, and so they partied together. But I don't, Nixon was not a very good partier. I don't think they were they really, really buddies. And Nixon thought that Ford, his would be a good vice presidential choice, partly because he thought, since Ford didn't know much about foreign policy, Congress would say, well, we can't get rid of Nixon. 
we have all this foreign policy because we'll get that Jerry Ford in here who doesn't know anything about foreign policy. Wrong call. Congress is only too happy uh, to have Jerry Ford in there. And that, so Nixon had thought Ford was going to be an insurance policy against himself getting impeached. Completely wrong. They were happy to get rid of Nixon to put Ford in there because they liked Ford. And Nixon, who usually had great political judgment, just called that <coughs> wrong. Uh, I do think Ford, having cast some question about Ford, I will also say I think Ford's decision to pardon Nixon took political courage. In fact, there's an argument that that cost him the 1976 election. That, in fact, he, it was the largest one-day drop in presidential Gallup polling when Nixon, excuse me, Ford pardoned Nixon. I don't remember the numbers, but man, his Gallup poll went yum, straight to the bottom. So it took political courage for him to do that. And I think he spared the country a terrible ordeal. The trial of Richard Nixon was going to be a mess. And the country was going to be convulsed by it uh, for months and months and months. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, boy, they've studied this. You know, Rosemary Woods, there's a famous photograph of Rosemary Woods. The eight, remember the 18 and a half minute gap in the tapes? Who did it? Poor Rosemary Wood, testifying, had to pose, you know, answering the phone with one hand and her foot out with the other. I mean, it was just ridiculous, uh, you know, just not plausible. They never found out. They've studied those tapes forever. Uh, there, I think, six or seven times somebody tried to stop them. Was that Richard Nixon being clumsy? One of the reasons why the tapes hung poor Richard Nixon was that he was so physically clumsy himself. In fact, Nixon, when he pinned medals on, you know, one of the things the president does is they pin medals on war heroes. Nixon kept stabbing the poor soldier, <laughs> so they had to put Velcro on instead of the pins. So Nixon, they made the tapes voice activated because Nixon couldn't figure out the damn buttons. Uh, and so every time he spoke, it recorded you know, er, er, everything. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I wandered off. What was the, what, uh, I, I got going on the tapes again. What was the, what was the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, she, whether well, did, yeah, she erased it. They don't know. I mean, I wish I could stand here and tell you, but it's not that this hasn't been studied, uh, but uh, it could have been Nixon himself uh, doing it. Uh, it could have been her at Nixon's direction. Maybe it was a mistake. I think they really actually don't know. The tape he erased was an early tape. There's even a lot of debate about what was on that tape. It might have been benign. The timing suggests that it, Nixon was acknowledging that he was going to cover up. But that's the timing. There's nothing in Haldeman's notes for that time span that suggests that Nixon did say that. So it's just there are always going to be mysteries. That's one of them. Anybody else? Thank you very much.